Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and the whirlwind sweeps them away like a chaff. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, my cause is disregarded by my God? Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle comes to us from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9. For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, since I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this that in preaching the gospel I may offer it free of charge, and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do this to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike blow to my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. This is the word of the Lord. We stand in honor of the Holy Gospel. Tomorrow is the day. The day that millions of people in America look forward to every year. The, gay, the day when their eyes will be transfixed on their television screens for the better part of about four hours. What they see might make them happy. It might make them frustrated. They might laugh or they might cry. Of course, what I'm talking about is the Super Bowl. Thank you. The Super Bowl commercials, specifically. Companies pay top dollar to have the opportunity to showcase their products to the masses. And as such, it had better be memorable. It helps if you have an ad with a catchy slogan to get irritatingly stuck in your head. Let's see if you can finish these slogans. Give me a break, give me a break, break me off a piece of that. Yeah, Kit Kat bar, good. How about this one? Maybe she's born with it, maybe it's Maybelline. Or this one. There are some things that money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. And then there's one that I remember fondly from my childhood. 
What would you do for a Klondike bar? The advertisers here would have an interviewer asking somebody if they would cluck like a chicken. Or sing, I'm a little teapot, short and stout. Here is my handle, here is my spout. Or any other host of ridiculous things that would be shown on television for many viewers to see. All for the sake of receiving a chocolate-coated ice cream loaded big and thick, no room for a stick. And while I don't intend to hand out ice cream bars following this message, sorry, I do have a different question for you today in light of Paul's words to the church in Corinth. What would you do for the sake of the gospel? In our epistle lesson today, Paul talks about what he would do for the sake of the gospel. He says how he would make himself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. Now what is Paul talking about here, winning people? Is this some sort of a game or sport like football, where the prize for winning is people? Thankfully not. <laughs> Instead, we see the full explanation of what Paul is claiming in verses 22 and 23, when he says, I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel. We see that for Paul, winning people is saving them. Paul works to save those people who are not familiar with the good news of the gospel. The gospel message that Christ is the Savior who died and rose again for all people so that all people might be saved from sin and the power of death and the power of the devil. Paul gladly preached this good news of the gospel free of charge. This passage also shares to us the scope of the means that Paul was willing to employ to those around him so that they might hear and receive the message of the gospel. He says to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. I think it's important to know what Paul is saying here. He recognizes that effective witness to those who are Jewish, those who are under the law, begins with understanding where their identity comes from. The Jews believed that their identity was from their relationship with God which was all related to following the laws of God. And though Paul recognized that in his relationship with Christ, he was no longer required to follow the more than 600 laws of the Torah to have a right standing with God, he needed to follow those laws to receive a hearing from his fellow Jews. By his following the law, which he was no longer under, People who felt themselves obligated to follow the law were willing to listen to Paul because of his willingness to follow the law. Paul continues by saying, To those not under the law, I became like one not under the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. Here Paul is acknowledging that there are people who have an identity that is not shaped by the law of the Torah. And yet even for those people, Christ died for their sins. Even those people are offered the promises of God. So without compromising on what is commanded in following Christ, Paul became like those people who did not follow the dietary restrictions of the Torah, and he did not treat anyone who is not circumcised as though they were outside of God's blessing. Instead, his desire was to win them also for the sake of the gospel. Paul goes on to say that, to the weak, he became weak to win the weak. Does that mean that Paul is making a distinction between people who got tired easily or who could not lift heavy objects and those that can? Well, no, it doesn't mean that. Here, Paul is referring to those people who have a weak conscience. We can better understand this by looking at the previous chapter, which was the epistle lesson that we heard last weekend. So in chapter 8, Paul is talking about how there are people who believed that the food that is offered to idols, by eating that food, you are worshiping that idol. And Paul says, the idol is nothing. It's just wood or metal. And the food is nothing more than just food. But that being said, 
the person who understands this, the Christian who understands that, you know, that idol is nothing, the food is nothing more than other food, but knows that they have a fellow Christian brother who sees them eating that and would struggle, would say, wait, you said you worship Christ. Why are you also worshiping this idol? For the sake of that fellow brother, they should abstain from eating that food in front of that brother. So Paul here is saying that those people who are weak of conscience, he was willing to abstain from what otherwise he was free to partake of. This was done so that they might not lose the faith that they have, especially on account of something that means nothing. Paul summarizes all this by stating he has become all things to all men so that by all possible means he might save some. He does all this for the sake of the gospel. Now the scope of how Paul did this might seem pretty wide, but I think it's important to say a few things that don't fit into the all possible means. For example, I don't think Paul would say, to the drunks I became a drunk so as to win the drunks. And in fact, many times in this letter to the church in Corinth, he talks about the importance of abstaining from drunkenness, sexual immorality, and idolatry. Because to engage in those practices would not be fitting with Christ's law that he just claimed earlier that he followed. Which leaves me with two questions to reflect on today in light of everything that we've just discussed. The first is, does everything that Paul has described apply to us? Are we called to be like a Jew, like one under the law, like one not having the law, weak, all things? To which I think, no, but mostly yes. It seems plausible that we are admonished to become all things to all men so that we might save some in light of the next chapter, chapter 10, where Paul says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Follow my example, Paul says, for I follow the example of Christ. And so we see that what Paul has said in this past chapter does apply to us as we seek to follow his example, ultimately for the sake of others, so that they too might be saved. And in Mark chapter 8, Jesus says to us, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. So while we might not specifically be called to be like a Jew, like one under the law or not having the law or weak, the force behind what Paul is saying to us does apply fully to us. That we should be ready to become all things to all men so that by all possible means we might save some. Now this comes to my second question then. What exactly does this mean for us? Well, Paul follows up the previous passage that we looked at with an example of an athletic competition, noting that only one gets the prize. This is not saying that the Christian life is one of competition with fellow Christians in which only one of us attain the true prize. No, instead, Paul is highlighting the focus necessary for an individual to be able to share the gospel with someone else. We ought to know for ourselves what the message of the gospel is for us. How is it that the gospel transforms your life? You should think about that question and practice how you would tell someone else about the gospel. However, it should be noted that different people have different worldviews and different influences that shape their identities. And so I believe that Paul would say to learn about the people around you. For example, if your understanding of how your life is transformed by the gospel message is something along the lines of, you are saved from sin, death, and the power of the devil because of the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, then how do you effectively share that message with someone who doesn't believe in sin or doesn't believe in the devil or who thinks that when someone dies, he or she comes back as something else and is not in need of rescue. Is that person too far gone from God that we should just give up on them until life perhaps drives them a little bit closer? I don't think so. 
Instead, we ought to learn from them what their worldview is and how they have arrived at their beliefs so that you can meet them where they're at and guide them to the truth concerning Christ in this way that relates to them. And this is how our God works. He doesn't wait for us to come to a base level knowledge or to a base level religious position and then reveal himself to us. No, Jesus comes to us in our brokenness. A brokenness that everyone who does not have a relationship with Christ experiences in his or her own way. And Christ uses us to reach others in their brokenness so that they too might be saved. So as Paul directs, run in such a way as to get the prize. That is, share the gospel message in such a way that it bears fruit in the person to whom it is given. Amen. We stand as we confess together the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, 